the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Hello. Hi. Hi. Today I'm talking with you from Mountain View, and that's about 40 miles away, a one and a half hour trip south on 101. And it's amazing that with Beam, I can literally be in two places at once. So I can present to you for 30 minutes here and then be at home when the carpool drops off my son from school. So I wanna thank Krista and Michelle for Suitable Technologies for providing Beam today. My name is Laura Lee, and I'm part of the marketing team at Quiver Vision. Today at the Future of Libraries conference, you've heard from great speakers about new technologies in online communities and how libraries can tap into them. As you all know, li libraries are being changed greatly by technology, how you interact with patrons through the resources that you offer, to the programming that enhances and enriches lives and cities. Quiver is an augmented reality company. You've probably heard of augmented reality in the last months, mostly in June with the summer craze around Pokemon Go. Next slide, please. Many libraries are harnessing this interest in catching Pokemon through programming activities. They created programming around the game. For example, the Psyduck in the stacks above, that yellow cartoon duck waddling around in the aisle was caught in the Canton Public Library in Michigan. Canton Library started a Pokemon Go group hunt for tweens, teens, and adults. The group met to scour the library of wild Pokemon and visit the surrounding Poke stops in a nearby park. Next slide, please. Other libraries, like this one in Cheshire, Connecticut, use this cultural phenomenon to lure patrons into the library, kind of like catching Pokemon. The sign says, we are a Poke stop. Come in, hang out, charge your phone, collect Pokeballs, snacks, lures, and more. Maybe do something old school and check out a book or a DVD while you're here. Next slide, please. The Farmer's Branch Mansky Library in Texas used the Pokemon game to advertise free library cards. Libraries have created programming around the game that includes introducing kids to physical privacy and safety issues in the digital world, how to become conscientious users of technology, and helping serve as media mentors for kids and families. Pokemon Go is still going strong, even though it is getting less press. As of yesterday, it regained its spot as the top grossing iPhone game in the US and is number one in 15 other countries. The game was referred to as a social media phenomenon, which has brought people together from all walks of life. Just in July, 231 million people engaged in 1.1 billion, billion interactions that mentioned Pokemon Go on Facebook and Instagram. Pokemon Go has also brought attention to augmented reality. Next slide, please. And Quiver Vision is benefiting from it because people are seeing how this technology can bring characters, stories, and learning to life. Quiver Vision is an augmented reality company that brings coloring pages to life. What does it mean brings to life? I'll show you. Cheryl, can you please click on the video link? Quiver Vision teaches and entertains children through animating 2D images 
using a tablet or mobile phone, fish swim over a page, birds soar through the sky, butterflies flit around flowers, dragons breathe fire into the sky, and planes fly through the air. Kids add coloring and texture to the 3D images. After they color a page, it is rendered onto the 3D animation. So augmented reality can be more than Pokemon Go. It is a growing industry that Goldman Sachs estimates will be an 80 to $182 billion market within the next 10 years. And it will be used in everything from games, education, training, interior design, construction, archeology, span engineering, product design, business to business sales, merchandising, marketing, and more. So what exactly is augmented reality and how does this differ from virtual reality? Next slide, please. Oh, that's, can you go back one slide? Is this the virtual reality slide? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Augmented reality, abbreviated as AR, is a technology that creates computer-generated sensory input, sound, video, graphics, GPS data, on top of a user's view of the real world. It seeks to enhance or augment reality. I think of it as essentially a data layer on top of reality that is viewed through, through a, such as a tablet. AR is different than AR, virtually. Virtual reality is a fully immersive environment, while AR keeps us in the real world. One of Quiver Vision's goals is to use AR to make learning come alive to students. Next slide, please. Quiver Vision is based in New Zealand with offices in Japan and the US. The technology was developed at the Human Interface Technology Lab in New Zealand, which is part of the University of Canterbury. The HIT Lab's mission is to put people before technology and support and empower them to solve real world problems and have positive global impact. Quiver Vision was spun off from the lab in 2012 and has a strong focus in education. Next slide, please. Our flagship app is Quiver Education. Here's a picture of a coloring page from the Quiver Education package and a preview of how it works. Please click the link on the video. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm actually going to take a, a photo because <laughs> I'm up here on stage. <laughs> I want to show my husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> through the Quiver Education app, kids can color animal cells and be quizzed on the different cell parts. They can test their plant cell knowledge, experience planet Earth from space, and discover the inner workings of a volcano and make it erupt. Uh, next slide, please. Here are fifth and sixth learning about cells. You see in the large photo that the engine is quizzing the cell about the construct of the cell. Next slide, please. Here kids are learning their patterns and the rotation of the earth.
Quiver, uh, uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Cheryl, the one with the app stores. Yes, I did that. Oh, cool, thanks. <laughs> Quiver and Quiver Education are available for download in the Apple App Store, Google Play, and the Amazon Store for the Fire Tablet. Quiver is a free app that has many free features and a couple of in-app purchases. Quiver Education is $7.99 and includes 14 packages of different coloring sheets, which you can see on our website. We work hard to make our product very affordable for educational institutions and libraries. For purchases of the app on multiple devices, we also offer a discount. Please contact us if your library is interested. Next slide, please. Here are more features of our app. You can print coloring sheets directly from our website. One of the amazing features is that you can see the 3D object rendered with your coloring in real time as you color the page. We have a proximity feature that shows your 3D object changing in size and perspective as you move the device closer to the page. Many of the 3D objects have associated games and quizzes. You can interact with 3D objects. For example, in one of our coloring sheets with a fire truck, it fills up a water from a hydrant and then a child can use the controls to raise the ladder and squirt water from a hose. Next slide, please. Here's a screenshot of the many free coloring sheets that you can download and use for programming in your library. Next slide. We provide easy educational tech programming one of our teachers tweeted, bored kids, smartphone or tablet, plus colored pencils, plus printer, plus download. Quiver Vision as a solution. This New Zealand wetland bird called the Pukeko was also tweeted about by the handle Class Tech Tips. Here it is fully colored as it looks in nature. Next slide, please. Here's a blank coloring sheet of a pumpkin. Quiver Vision has many coloring sheets for your library program. I've provided the Future of Library conference with this free coloring sheet for, the, for you to use to distribute as you, you like. It is a little different from the upstream sheets. With a thick black pen, you fill in the air, you call the pumpkin rest of the drawing is white. I'll show you how it works. Next slide, please. I've written in thick black marker, read on my pumpkin. Then I open the Quiver app and hold my tablet or smartphone over the image. I want to make sure that my device captures the whole image. If it doesn't, the page will appear red like this page here on my left. Next slide, please. After the app recognizes the image, it will turn blue like this page and then render the 3D augmented reality object. As you can see, my jack-o'-lantern has read now carved into it and a candle is burning inside. It is also accompanied by music when I view this through my iPhone. Next slide, please. What's amazing is that the pumpkin will change in size and perspective when I move the device closer and farther from the page. In these images, you see the jack-o'-lantern from above and my three-year-old son is posing with the pumpkins in another view. 
This Halloween pumpkin coloring sheet is for your use. I hope that you can start introducing augmented reality to your library and bring learning to us, to life. <laughs> Next slide, please. If you are interested in learning more about Quiver Vision, please connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, or email us at info at quivervision.com. We'll provide all this information to the Future of Library Conference organizers to send out to you. Next slide, please. Also, we'd like to invite you to join the Quiver Vision Ambassador, Teacher, and Librarian Program. We'll keep you up to date on the newest educational material and advances in augmented reality. Please go to our website and sign up. We would love to have your libraries take part in introducing augmented reality. Thank you for your time today. Are, are there any questions? <laughs> Is Angela there? <laughs> no, I think she went out drinking. <laughs> I think she was driving home, so I hope that's not true. <laughs> I know my employees. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? How are you driving that thing? Oh, so you're up for a treat because Krista is going to beam in and she's going to tell you more about this amazing piece of technology. Uh, you mentioned that so there, there are coloring sheets. Oh. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, what? You, just, you, you mentioned that there are, there are more coloring sheets that are available. Where would we get those? Um, so if you go to the Quiver Vision website, you can download free sheets. So we have two apps. We have a free app, and then we have an education app, which costs $7.99 for 14 packages of coloring sheets. Thank you. So just take a look at our website and email us if you have any questions. Laura, we got one more question. Great. Thank you. Um, so I've taken a look at your website, and I'm just wondering, like, what, I mean, without going into obviously much detail, because it's probably proprietary, but I mean, what areas are you looking to open up your educational programs? Like, is it more science? Is it more kids with disabilities? I mean, what's, what's, what, what can we expect if we keep following you and keeping updated to your company's updates? So, so right now we have a, a lot of content in human biology for about the fifth and sixth grade level. So like understanding plant cells, animal cells. Um, we have geography and learning about the earth. So teachers and librarians use this content um, for pretty much um, ages five to um, 11, 11 or 12. Um, we're moving into more human biology in terms of understanding the whole human body. We also have many modules about nature, learning about birds, insects, different types of animals in their habitat. If you are interested in a certain area, um, we'd love to hear your input. So please send us an email if you see that we're missing a content area that you think children would really enjoy and would like to see through 3D models. You can also email the CEO. I'll give you the CEO's email address. <laughs> it's Niles, N-I-L-S, at quivervision.com. And he loves to hear from 
different users and how they're employing Quiver Vision in the classroom or the library. Okay, thanks a lot, Cheryl. Thanks, Laura. Thank, thank you, guys. Um, I'll be beaming out, and then Krista will be beaming in to talk more about suitable technologies and the device you see in front of you. Bye. Hello. Hi. Hi. Just turn my volume up a little bit. Do I sound okay to you guys? Get me okay? Are you? You're Cheryl? I am yes. Cheryl. Hi, I'm Krista. <laughs> You'll be advancing my slide, yeah? Uh, yes, uh, though we don't really have your slides up yet, so I can put your website up there. Oh, okay. Um, we will get that up pretty shortly, okay, but uh, you can address my audience. All right. And, uh, Thanks, Cheryl. Hello to them while we uh, figure it out. Oh, there we go. Super. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, Hello, everybody. All right. Thanks, <laughs> Cheryl. Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Krista. I'm with Suitable Technologies, and we are the creator and maker of the Beam system. The device that I'm on is the Beam Pro. Um, thank you for inviting us to join your event today and to talk about the future of museum or libraries. Um, I am coming to you from Seattle, Washington. And my role at Suitable is uh, Director of Education Business Development. And that includes our university and education partners, but also our cultural arts partners. And that includes museums and performing arts centers. Um, on a personal note, I love libraries. I have my entire life. I don't remember a time that the local library was not part of my existence. And um, I think the work that you do, not only in, in educating your communities, but also providing a space for um, programming and discussion and just continues to expand once they get into this new digital age that um, is just providing worldwide access to everything. And I think telepresence really uh, feeds into that. So with no further ado, let's move on to Beam. Slide, please. So what is telepresence and mobile telepresence specifically? So the Beam system is a mobile telepresence system, and that means that it has wheels. So it's a video conferencing system that the user from their computer can log into, and using their um, arrows on their keyboard, their mouse, However, they control their computer, they can control this device. And that provides the user with the freedom of, of being there, of choosing their path, of having control over where they go and when they go. Um, what makes that different from, different from uh, traditional video conferencing is really that control and that you're not reliant on somebody else setting up the computer in the you know, destination space um, that when an event is over, you can you know, roll out with a colleague, with somebody that you've just met and continue that conversation. So there's, there's a um, casualness that comes with telepresence in a mobile way. Uh, the host site, so in our case, the library today, has control over who has access to their device. So it's, um, our system has an administrative tool so you can grant temporary access, you can observe the device in time, certain days, certain people. Um, I have some clients that are being open to their use from 9 a.m. to them at those controls as provide some who has access to your space when. Slide. So where are beams being used? Slide. The workplace. So the beam was 
invented to solve a challenge in corporate America. Uh, being launched in 2012, so went into development a couple of years before that. And at the time, the, um, our parent company had a remote team. So one of our engineers had moved out of state and he was getting very quickly frustrated with the difference and having been in the office and now being a remote employee. So um, he was a, he is a robotic engineer. So he took things upon himself and took the base of the robot that Willow Garage had developed and um, used the laptop that he could remotely access and created the beta type of um, the beam device. If any of you are Big Bang Theory watchers, the shell bot was an early rendition of this device um, as it was being tested and developed into what you see today. So um, by using this in the workplace, you're not only able to bring remote employees into the office for meeting, collaboration, brainstorming, discussions, um, my colleague, Michelle, who's been setting this up today, she and I are both remote employees and we, we see each other on Beam and that's how we talk to each other. Uh, rarely do we get to physically be in the same place at the same time. Um, but it also allows companies to now bring their clients into their offices with ease. It allows manufacturing companies to be present in their uh, manufacturing facilities, oftentimes those are overseas abroad and the travel time um, can be expensive there. But with a solution like Beam, a mobile telepresence solution, they can beam into that warehouse. They can walk the line with their colleagues there and have real-time conversations. Slide. Uh, another use that is part of my world with Beam is education. And as education has been evolving over the last decade, distance learning has become a important component to what higher education is doing. Now with mobile telepresence, remote students are able to be in the classroom. So for subjects that require um, interaction with fellow classmates, like education classes, nursing, medical, um, there's so many subjects that a big part of that learning is learning from others and having um, taking those ideas and really talking them through with your fellow classmates. We, um, we work with many research universities who are using our device for uh, research in different subjects. One of them is Michigan State University and they are focusing on the question of what adding mobility to teleconferencing does for the user. And they're finding it's interesting. Um, you know, some of them are supposed to hear, uh, but so it's always interesting to see the final study. But they, they're, so they did find that remote participants who use versus um, a traditional video conference thing did feel that they had a greater sense of presence in the classroom and also had an ability to build with their fellow classmates. And as a remote employee, I totally get how this device would create an environment where that happens in that you can have those casual conversations that you would have in the lunchroom or you would have at the water cooler. But when you are remote and you're only just coming in for that video conference, you don't have those, those casual interactions. So it's, it's building a community, you're like you're part of that community. Um, another great example in education, uh, uh, high school that we work with in Brooklyn um, is using the beam to bring subject experts into the classroom. So to bring the curriculum that they're learning sort of alive and providing it with a real use case. Uh, I was in New York a couple weeks ago and I got to go to the high school to meet with their principal and uh, their facilitators. And while I was there, they're like, oh, we have someone beaming in to one of the Latin classes, would you like to see? And I was like, absolutely. So um, go into a freshman Latin class. So there are three years into, or three weeks into studying Latin. And they have a priest beam in from the Vatican to talk to these kids in Latin. 
you know, these kids, I'm sure were all like, I don't know enough to talk to this guy, but they all did and they all engaged with him. And he was in control of that room that he had their attention for the entire half hour that he was there talking with them. And I think it was just an exciting opportunity for them. And that's why it was an engaging one. Um, another of our university clients is in the planning stages for a pilot program where they're going to work with three other universities and have a crossover STEM focused curriculum. And that means that they, these four universities will pick what classes they have their strengths in and then open up to the other three institutions that they will have eight of our devices on campus and eight students from those other universities can take that class. So that each of these four universities does, don't have to duplicate those classes, they're able to provide a pool of their resources. Um, so that will be interesting because it will be a research project as well to see how the students, uh, what their takeaway is from that experience. But I, I think it's really promising. Slide, please. So next up is cultural sites. And this is very near and dear to me because it was what I was brought into suitable technologies to do. Um, my background in museum technology. And when uh, I was approached about coming to work and seeing this device and the possibilities in the museum space, which I think is somewhat relevant to the library space. Um, most museums are either public institutions or we would classify as public institutions. And by opening up their um, collections and ex exhibits to a broader audience is, is part of their mission. Um, same as, as I would suspect for libraries, that community extending access is important. Launched Beam in Museum. Uh, Beam is early adopters of new technology. Uh, it was important <laughs> to find a key part. And we were lucky to the Beyond Museum here in San Francisco. Um, so they launched a project with us, focusing on accessibility. And they ran extensive training with their docents and volunteers, created a, a core group of trained docents to provide tours on the beam. Um, they did a lot of uh, research and feedback within the disabled community. So they did a bunch of testing rounds to see what worked, what didn't work. Same on the docent side to really get buy-in from the community that they were trying to serve, but as the, the people on the ground, you had to make sure it was successful. Um, at the end of that testing program, which took about nine months, the end result was that there was a value in this. Um, there was a value to the users, but also to the museum. And they have since launched a formal Beam tour program as part of their accessibility program. Um, as that was, program was developing, and we started a couple of other uh, pilot programs with other museums, we started to think about how else could we use this technology to broaden the audience. And um, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View was the first to say, let's try bringing a school group in on Beam and see if we can't provide access to underserved schools in our community, a way to easily and with no cost and you know, have a tour. So um, to test that out, they needed a school. And I happen to have the best friend in Brooklyn, New York, who is a fifth grade teacher. So I talked to her, can you get your principal to OK this? And she did. So her fifth grade class sat around a large screen, as you guys are today. Um, the teacher controlled the beam device and they went on a tour of the computer history museum. I got to have extra feedback because the teacher, as I said, is a personal friend. And she told me it was the first time that school year that they all were quiet at the same time, <laughs> which she thought was remarkable. Um, but the, the kids were engaged and it was about an hour and a half, the tour, they had good questions. Um, and it, it, we, definitely found that there was a value in it. So um, Computer History Museum and the San Diego Air and Space Museum have both been sort of tweaking their educational outreach program so that 
nor curriculum driven uh, education programs are able to be conducted on beam. So that's pretty cool. And then um, the last example I want to use, uh, share with you about the museum world is the American Museum of Natural History, which is in New York City. And they are using their beam in their one of their older exhibits that has not been updated in a couple of decades. And it's their Indigenous Peoples Gallery. So the story that's being told in there is not necessarily accurate and it's not contemporary. So uh, it's a very dated exhibit. And when they were talking about, you know, that it really requires a huge overhaul, what else could they do? And they have partners with a bunch of Native, community, Native American communities across North America whose objects are part of the collection. So they reached out to this organization and said, is there a way I can better tell your story from your point first person? And so, um, and then we talked to Beam and how would that work in galleries? Well, they're offering a program in this gallery where they have either artisans or curators, these tribes, beam in and talk to the visitors about like what, what is the importance of this object and how do we use it today? And it's still important to our culture and um, really providing uh, a, a point of understanding to these objects that are you know, quite remarkable and are part of all of our history. Um, and that's been very successful and exciting. So you know, bringing, bringing the subject expert to provide that unique point of view uh, is something that's very exciting about Beam. Slide. So then it comes back to why is this important to you guys? So I, I do think that there is crossover to other uses that we've seen Beam successful in or telepresence in general successful in. Um, again, that's bringing in subject experts. And I would love to see the day where museums have a station you know, on a computer and we have beams in libraries and museums and your patrons can come in and check out an hour on a beam you know, at the Taj Mahal or at the Met Museum. And that it's part of the, the services that your libraries offer their communities. As well as if somebody you know, comes in and they, they wanna know more about 12th century manuscripts, they can beam into University of Cambridge and meet with their librarian who that's what they know about, that's what their collection has. So that, that you're able to have expansive knowledge beyond what your library's resources are and really tap into a whole network of um, information. I think um, it also could be used in your community programming, whether that's a lecture series. I know a lot of museums provide professional service assistance, so whether it's um, small business mentoring or tax assistance, um, to be able to have that subject expert come in and, and meet with a small group of people. Um, I think including it in technology education. So we have a library client who has uh, one of our smaller Beam, Beam Plus in their collection now, and is part of their educational training when it comes to technology. So they'll have groups come in and they'll talk about remote telepresence, they'll talk about robotics, and this is just one of those tools that they use. Um, and then another very important piece of what Beam can do is provide accessibility. So um, libraries, the same as museums, are, are part of our communities. And to be able to extend access to the physically disabled in a very easy way on their end um, is really a fantastic opportunity to serve your communities. Um, with that said, I'm just going to quickly slide, please. So last year was the silver anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act. Um, we did a lot of uh, conferences that focused on the ADA and, and what the next steps in the future for that look like. Um, and 
we were had a fantastic opportunity to have a beam at the White House for a woman, Alice Wong, being honored as part of the White House's celebration of the anniversary. And she um, has binocular atrophy and was unable to travel from San Francisco. So it came to our attention. We said, absolutely, let's get a beam there. Um, so there, we have a fun video clip of that moment. So slide, please. Slide, please. So um, the use of telepresence devices for individuals with physical disabilities is really remarkable. And I have had the, the privilege of working with a gentleman by the name of Henry Evans, who had a um, stroke about 14 years ago, and that left him a quadriplegic. He was 40 years old when it happened. Um, and it, you know, it changed his world entirely. Um, in the years since, he has founded an organization called Over Humanity, and the focus is technology and seeing how it can provide service to disabled groups, to disabled individuals. And OT has built amazing relationships with university computer labs. Um, he's got research projects in Sydney, Australia, Carnegie Mellon, at, uh, Georgia Tech, at Stanford, and just continues to, to ask the question, ask for access, ask for um, solutions. And through his, his work and dedication, he's really exposed Beam to um, a number of organizations and people. Um, and you know, he was he was one of the main initiators at our museum program. So I just have one more short clip. Um, and this is uh, from CBS Sunday Morning, who did a piece on Henry and the Dion Museum. Seeing the museum this way it allowed you to explore the museum. The way Henry Evans, who is almost completely paralyzed. It's been a long day, huh? <laughs> We have a couple of questions. Okay. Actually, I, I have a quick one for you. On a couple of the videos, we were able to see your perspective or the perspective from the beam. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you were able to show us that on your screen here so we could kind I of see how you, you on see my us. Screen, I don't know how helpful that'll be because the screens, but that, this is what I, I see you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can, do you see the, the blue line? So that's to show me the path that I'm taking. So I can see if oh, I'm at something. Um, and you have a couple of, you have screen share and Zoom, a couple of clips in there as well. Uh, do you only need a laptop? Um, on the other end there, are you, uh, we're seeing you through you your You can use webcam. a laptop, desktop, computer. You can use, we have a mobile app for iOS and Android. Um, the tablet, it works fairly well. The phone, I think the screen is just a little too small. And I have the big iPhone. So I think, you know, if you're using this for an hour plus, you would want to use the laptop or a tablet. The laptop's definitely the best experience. What's the top uh, cruising speed? This can robot. go up to two miles per hour, which is a decent walking speed. You're not gonna go from San Francisco to Seattle on it. <laughs> well, I mean, you can do it the way I just did it, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I was involved in the BEAM project at the De Young, and so Thank I was you. sitting here thinking, I would love to see this used in libraries to have people use their laptops to call in and, and be involved in a book discussion group or come to any of our programs. Yeah, I think it's a great access tool, absolutely. You just think about if you're in Henry's situation, that having those outlets 
to get you out of your room where you're spending 20 hours a day and just mentally be in a different place, this can allow that to happen. Could you see well enough uh, when you beam in, say you were going to look at some microfilm and you couldn't physically come to the library to do that, would you be able to see well enough that I could guide you to the mic microfilm and you might be able to see that on screen? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I haven't used microfilm in such a long time. I do remember that that screen is... <laughs> I didn't mean that in any way to be negative. Welcome to the library. But um, that the screen is fairly large and can be magnified. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I came into the office, I can see somebody else's computer if they have it angled so the light isn't glaring on it um, or I angle the beam. Um, so I, I, I definitely think it'd be worth trying. Let's see if that works. Hi, um, I was wondering if this has been tested at all with people with maybe like severe anxiety or like agoraphobia, if this like makes a difference in whether or not they're able to like go out into the world and interact. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I do think for some people it makes things more comfortable. So for me personally, if I was physically standing there in front of you, my heart would be palpitating, but it's better on beam. Um, so I definitely think that for some people, it, it removes the barrier. Uh, we did a pilot program with a children's hospital and um, found that some of those kids were really overwhelmed by the experience because people came up to them and you know, talked to them in a way that they were not prepared for, were not comfortable with. So, and, and that's, that's more uh, that I think on your side, people will just come up to somebody on something like this and say, what is this? Where are you? What are you doing? Um, but there's a curiosity there that, uh, you know, people are, are going to be more approaching whether the person who's on the other side is more approachable is a good question. I think for some people it does some of that uh, anxiety. Would you come to my library and do story time for the kids? <laughs> <laughs> I, was thinking, I would love to. <laughs> I was thinking how much they so would My first they would job when I was, was um, assisting with the summer reading program at my local public library. So I would love to do story time. <laughs> I was thinking that maybe people that Find are homebound up. or who can't get out, what a wonderful right, way again. for them to interact with their community is for them to be able to come and um, you know maybe help with a story time. There's another thing about libraries is that people often find things, um, you know, when they come in the library, they find things that they weren't looking for. So to have somebody be able to come and roam the stacks of the library with that, we have a lot of um, caregivers that come in to check out for people who are homebound. But wouldn't mm -hmm. it be awesome if they could come in with this beam yeah, with their caregiver absolutely. and say, oh, I want to see that title there, that one that I didn't know existed. Yeah. And here it and is, and I want, I want check that it one. out, But someone can help them do that who has ham. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's part of the library experience that you, you go to look for one book, but you find seven because you get to browse the stack. Okay, thank you guys so much. Have a good night. And with that, thank you again for coming. Um, you should have received uh, a survey, so please fill that out for us. That's how we decide what to do next year. Um, and take all of your feedback into account. That makes a big difference.